Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. It is that time again when I show you all the books that I got in the month of June. Now obviously June was my birthday month so I did get four books for my birthday and I bought myself two brand new books. All the others are second hand from the charity shop or apart from one <clears throat> which was Paul's mum's but she uh, wasn't enjoying it so she gave it to us and I'll start with that one that is David Mitchell's Unruly. Um, time is as crucial as place you can stand in the same place and depending on the time you might find yourself on your own in the mud run through by a Norman knight praying for a king's soul being made redundant by another king having a nice pint or buying a nasty coffee when the battle of Hastings happened the town of battle didn't yet exist so they named the battle after Hastings except it Otherwise it would have been called the Battle of Battle. Except it wouldn't because if battle existed before the battle happened it wouldn't have been called Battle. It was named Battle after the battle. So obviously this is David Mitchell so it's going to be funny but uh, Sally didn't like the, the style of writing but it, it, reading that back makes me think yes I am going to really enjoy this book. <clears throat> Another non-fiction book I picked up was uh, This Much Is True by Miriam Margoyles the actress and comedian she's so funny i love her she's been in blackadder call the midwife oh god she's done absolutely everything this woman and she is so funny so basically the inside says i have no secrets i decided very early on in life that the strongest position was to be completely open <clears throat> bafta women in actor voice of everything from monkey to the cadbury's caramel bunny and if you don't you know go and watch those uh, creator of a myriad of unforgettable characters from Lady Whiteadder to Professor Sprout, Miriam Margoyles is the nation's favourite and cheekiest treasure. Now at the age of 80 she's finally decided to tell her life story and it's well worth the wait. Find out how being conceived during an air raid gave her curly hair, what pranks led to Miriam being known as the naughtiest girl ever educated at Oxford High School, how as a teenager she ended up posing nude for Augustus John, what she did when Warren Beatty asked do you fuck? and much much more. This memoir takes you on an extraordinary adventure through a truly independent mind in life with a cast expressing from Martin Sors I can't even speak, Scorsese to Barbara Streisand, a cross-dressing Leonardo DiCaprio to an incomprehensible Isaiah, Ber Isaiah Berlin. This much is true, is clever and self-critical, as warm and honest, as full as life and surprises as its wonderful author. Now, Miriam Margoyles, if you look at her, fantastic actress or actor, she is everybody's favourite to play everybody every Terry Pratchett Discworld fan's favourite to play uh, Nanny Og. <laughs> she would be the perfect Nanny Og. Um, so let's have a look at the paperback. Okay uh, then I've got uh, Anna Max Dead Being Committed. This is the cover. Let me just can I zoom out anymore? Yeah. Um, Hannah thinks you have to be insane to get married. She's content with her life, the job of a private investigator at Hound Dog Investigations. The boyfriend of five years, Jason, and the wonderful father, pity her mother is such a disaster, besides which she's tried marriage once before, but she ended up divorced before she was 21. So when the long-suffering Jason proposes, Hannah doesn't think twice about turning him down. Still, she's a little shaken when, a month later, the man has the nerve to get engaged to somebody else. Is she not up to settling down? Hannah's family are convinced she blew her one chance of hooking a permanent man and maybe, just maybe, there's something in Jason's theory that being committed means first coming to terms with your past. Well, I'm sorry, but Jason couldn't have been that committed if he got engaged to somebody else one month after she turned him down. Do you know what I mean? Sorry, it's hot up here, so I've got the fan on. I'm just trying to actually get it to blow on me a little bit. <laughs> you know, he's not very, very serious about her if he gets engaged a month after she turns him down. MC Beaton. Agatha Raisin, down the hatch. <clears throat> Nothing could be more relaxing or sedate than a quiet game of bowls on a pristine bowling green bathed in the sunshine of an English summer's afternoon in the Cotswolds. Unless it's a dead body lying on the grass. Agatha Raisin becomes embroiled in a turmoil of jealousy and lies when the tranquility of her local bowls club explodes, explodes into a storm of accusation and intrigue. And murder. Her private life is no less turbulent when a past suitor reappears, just as her ex-husband seems intent on rekindling their romance, and her close friend, Bill Wong, is in danger of losing the woman he loves. 
Events take an even darker turn when Agatha realises that in pursuing the Bowling Green Killer, she's putting her own life in danger. I like those. I've only read a couple of them, but I do, I have enjoyed the ones I've read. So, yeah, let me just get a bit more comfortable. Right, there we go, that's a bit better. And then I've got The Murder After the Night Before. This is by Katie Brent. I do like the cover and the title is intriguing. Something bad happened last night. I've woken up with a hangover from hell, a stranger in my bed, and I've gone viral for the worst reasons. But I can't remember a thing. My best friend Posey is dead. The police think it was a tragic accident, but I know she was murdered. There's only one thing stopping me from dying of shame. I need to find a killer. Uh, a wickedly witty and utterly addictive novel, novel, novel from the author of How to Kill Men and Get Away With It. So yeah, I like the sound of that. That sounds quite good. And again, these are all from the charity shop. Most of them were 25p. Uh, the hardback Miramont Goyles was a bit more expensive, obviously, but uh, I'm quite happy with that. Then I got Until Next Weekend by Rachel Marks. No idea. That's why I only read the backs quickly you see. Noah and Kate were meant to be together forever. Married with two gorgeous sons it looked like they'd got their happy ever after but marriage isn't easy and one day Kate left taking the two boys, two boys with her. These days Noah is a weekend dad and it breaks his heart. He misses the chaotic mealtimes, the bedtime stories, the early mornings and the late homework. <clears throat> Suddenly he decides enough is enough. He has to win his family back starting with Kate. The only problem, in six weeks time, Kate is getting married to someone else. Mm. You see, my charity shop, <clears throat> local charity shop, is in such good books. How can I possibly leave them there? That's why my TBR is getting so, well, it is huge. It's a 466. But that's only because I started one the other day. But what can I do when they, they get in such good books? I can't leave them there. The Game by Scott Kershaw. Again, never heard of this guy, but this sounds really good. Across the globe, five strangers receive a horrifying message from an unknown number. The person you love most is in danger. To save them, each must play the game, a sinister unknown contest that has a single rule. There can only be one winner. If you lose, your loved one will die. But what is the game and why have they been chosen? There's only one thing each of them knows for sure. They'll do anything to win. Welcome to the game. You've just started playing. Oh, see that sounds sounds good. A bit sore-ish maybe. By the you know the whole there can only be one winner and, and, and who knows. I don't know. Maybe a bit Squid Game. <laughs> I don't I have no idea, but I just thought it sounded really good. And then I've got the last. Uh, Hannah Jameson. Uh, the world has ended in nuclear war. You and 19 other survivors hole up in an isolated Swiss hotel. You wait. You survive. Then you find the body. One of your number has blood on their hands. The race is on to find the killer before the killer finds you. I mean, doesn't that sound good? I mean, shoosh. Woo, I'm loving it. Right, next stack still from the charity shop. Yes, I know, I'm bad. I sort of start off the month so good, I go like maybe a week, two weeks without going in the charity shop. And then I have to go to the shop and, and, and I get something and I think, oh, I'll just nip in and have a look. And this is the thing, today I don't have to go to the shop near the charity shop. I usually go down there, get Jennifer a dip dab, I get myself a drink, and then I, I, I go in the shop on the way back. Or I go into the butchers to get something for mum and I go in the charity shop which is next door. Today I don't have to go in there so I'm not going to buy any books. <laughs> I did go in the shop yesterday and I still managed to avoid going in the charity shop. I'm going to see how long I can go before I go in there this month. Uh, it won't be long because at the moment they've got a big sign up saying we cannot take any books so I need to relieve them of some of them obviously. They haven't got enough space for more books. Better Off Dead by Tom Wood. <laughs> A hitman must be anonymous, immoral and alone. Victor is the face in the crowd you don't see. A perfect assassin with nothing to live for. 
but when an old friend turns to him for help, he finds he can't refuse. For once, his objective isn't to kill, but to protect. Hunted through the streets of London by ruthless enemies, Victor needs to be more than just a bodyguard, but his every move leads danger to the very person he's vowed to defend. So that sounds good, assassin turned um, bodyguard. I like it, I like it, yeah. I've got a very small one here. This is just to help with my Goodreads challenge. I'm actually three ahead on schedule, so I'm not too worried at the moment. If I fall behind, I've got a couple more really short books and some children's books that I can read. This one is called A Sea Change, uh, and it's by Veronica Henry. Jenna is known as the ice cream girl. She doesn't mind the name one bit. After all, there are far worse jobs than selling ice creams by the sea. Then one hot summer's day, everything changes and Jenna faces the most difficult decision of her life. Craig spends as much time as he can at the beach hut in Everdeen he rents with a few of his mates. It's a perfect break from his stressful job and he loves to surf. But one, re one weekend, he notices the girl on the beach for all the wrong reasons. For Jenna and Craig, it's a chance meeting which could change their lives forever. So that sounds quite good. But like I said, it's really short. So it's not, it's like, how many pages is it? It's like 90 pages long, so it's perfect. I've got another one of them in here, but it's buried. Then I've got The Evidence of Ghosts by A.K. Benedict. Maria King knows a secret London. Born blind, she knows the city by sound and touch and smell. But now that surgery has restored her sight, the world seems a scarier place, and she doesn't want to see it. DCI Jonathan Dark also sees a different side to the city. He is in the shadows, haunted by his failure to save a woman from the hands of a stalker, and he won't let it happen again. Now a killer has set his sights on Maria, and Jonathan must find a way to stop him. But when gathering evidence, you can't choose your source. Can you save the living by talking to the dead? So I said that sounds so good. Then we've got uh, Jodie Pico, Change of Heart. I'm picking up Jodie Pico's as and when they come in and I see them. Um, yeah. So June has survived what no mother should face. 12 years ago, her husband and young daughter were murdered. For the sake of her unborn child, she managed to carry on living. But now she faces losing a second daughter. Claire has a heart defect. Unless they find a donor soon, she will die. When a match is offered, it seems like a miracle until June learns that the new heart will come from the man who killed Claire's sister. She thought she would do anything to keep her child alive, but how should, can she give her daughter the heart of a murderer? It's a bit of a coincidence, isn't it? That it's a match and all that stuff. But that wouldn't be a story if it wasn't. It's just me and my cynicism sneaking through there. It does happen. Um, John Green, Paper Towns, never read this, but thought I would pick it up. Um, the thing about Margot Roth Spiegelman is that really all I could ever do was let her talk, and then when she stopped talking, encourage her to go on, due to the fact that one, I was incontestably in love with her, and two, she was absolutely unprecedented in every way, and three, she never really asked me any questions. Quentin Jacobson has always loved Margot from afar, so when she climbs through his window to summon him on an all-night road trip of revenge, he cannot help but follow. But the next morning, Q turns up at school and Margot doesn't. She's left clues to her disappearance like a trail of breadcrumbs for Q to follow. And everyone leads to everything leads to one unavoidable question. Who is the real Margot? Now I'm sure lots of you have read Paper Towns. What's it like? Is it good? Should I put this to the top of the TBR? Should this be read really soon or can it wait a bit? Let me know. This is the other quick shots uh, or quick reads this they're, they're called and this is called Wrong Time Wrong Place by Simon Koenig. Have you ever been in the wrong place at the wrong time? You're hiking in the Scottish Highlands with three friends when you come across a girl. She's half naked, has been badly beaten and she can't speak English. She is clearly running away from someone. Do you stop to help her, even if it means putting your friends' lives and your own in terrible danger? See, and again, this one is a bit longer than the other one, but not by long. I don't know, there's quite a lot of extra pages in here with other books in it. And there's a list of quick reads. It's quite long, there's some Doctor Who ones as well, so I might have to see if I can look them up. 
Um, 92, it's only two pages long with the other one, so that's really cool. I think they've got to be under 100 pages to be counted as quick reads. Uh, Patricia Cornwall, Livid, a Scarpetta novel, so I'm going to have trouble pronouncing Scarpetta again all the way through this video, well, through this book. Okay. Here's the cover. Murder and Mayhem, Scarpetta is back and she's racing against the clock. <clears throat> Case Carpetta is testifying in a sensational murder trial when she receives shocking news the judge's sister has been killed. At first glance it appears to be a home invasion, but then why was nothing stolen and why is the garden eerily strewn with dead plants and insects? The cause of death is a mystery, but the forensic pathologist begins to piece together clues that point to an unthinkable crime with roots in her own past. The worst is yet to come, and Scarpetta's time to catch the killer is running out. I have to really slow down to read it, because of the name. Then I've got The Guilty Couple by a C.L. Taylor. It's not the only C.L. Taylor I have, I have another one on the bookshelf, so obviously there's something drawing me to this author. I think it's obviously the stories. What would you do if your husband framed you for murder? Five years ago, Olivia Sutherland was convicted of plotting to murder her husband. Now she's finally free, Olivia has three goals. Repair her relationship with her daughter, clear her name, and bring down her husband, the man who framed her. Just how far is she willing to go to get what she wants? And how far will her husband go to stop her? Because his lies run deeper than Olivia could ever imagined. And this time it's not her freedom in jeopardy, but her life. So those are all the ones that I got from the charity shop or from Sally's mum. Now Paul bought me two, no let's do this one first. So Andrew Cartmel's new book came out last month which is Ashram Assassin. This is book two in the paperback sleuth series which is in turn a spin-off from the Vinyl Detective set in the same world. Some of the same characters cross over such as Stinky Stanmer, Jordan Tinkler, Nevada and Agatha occasionally. Some of the locations as well like the Albert Gastro Pub. So in this one, when a collection of rare and valuable volumes is stolen from a West Lunga yoga ashram, its leaders turn to Cordelia, the paperback sleuth, to recover them. <clears throat> a request that's a little awkward as they've previously booted her out for dealing weed to the other students. But Cordelia takes the job and she finds a quest for the missing paperbacks turning into a murder hunt as those associated with the ashram can't seem to avoid violent death. Whether bludgeoned with a whiskey bottle or poisoned by an admittedly delicious curry, can she work out who the killer is and bring them to justice before she ends up as the next victim? I love, I love Andrew Cartman's books. Uh, Paul bought me this book, Children of the Dust. It's a, uh, I'm going to say it's a middle grade book. Um, Louise Lawrence wrote The Earth Witch, which I got off eBay last year, I believe, because um, Paul was telling me about this book that he read in school that he really hated and it was set in, in Wales, so it's set up in the valleys where I'm, I grew up and it's a lot about Welsh folklore and witches and things and he just a very very female orientated protagonist put your teeth in now protagonist of the earth witch herself um, even though that the main character is a young boy but I really enjoyed earth witch much to Paul's chagrin I'm sure because he hated it um, but he has bought me one of her other books which is children of the dust look at that cover so everyone thought when the alarm bell rang that it was just another fire practice but the first bombs had fallen on Hamburg and Leningrad the headmaster said and a full-scale nuclear attack was imminent it's a real life nightmare. Sarah and her family have to stay cooped up in the tightly sealed kitchen for days on end, dreading the inevitable radioactive fallout and the subsequent slow torturous death, which seems almost preferable to surviving in a gray, dead world choked by dust. But then out of the dust and ruins and the desolation comes new life, a new future, and a whole brave new world. So that sounds interesting. And it's not very, it's another short book. So it's like 170 pages, a bit longer. Yeah, 172 pages, not very long at all. He also bought me this book by Noel W. E. Hilly, and it's called Ask for Andrea. Obviously he bought it because it's got Andrea in the title, because he said, have I bought you this before? And I went, no. So, so Megan, Brickia, Brickia and Skye have just one thing in common. 
They were all murdered by the same man. He hunted them online, masquerading as an eligible bachelor. Then he played the perfect gentleman, a thick layer of charm and a thousand watt smile, hiding the fact that his first dates end in shallow graves. He's gotten away with murder three times now. The only thing that might keep him from killing again, the women he murdered. Megan, Brickia and Skye might be dead, and I do apologise if I'm saying her and Brickia's name wrong because I don't know how to pronounce it, but they're not gone. They've found each other and they won't rest till they find a way to stop him. The haunt is on. So uh, this is going to be a, my kind of book. It's, it's um, a murder mystery. Well, it's not a mystery because we they know who killed them, but it's a, a murder story. It's got ghosts. It sounds really, and it's got my name in the title. So I don't know why I ask for Andrea when the, none of the three characters are called Andrea. I'll have to read it and find out, won't I? I did buy one Marilyn book myself. This is uh, one of only two books I bought full price this month, and this is called. Uh, an iconic influencer, Marilyn Monroe, Tales from the Making of Niagara 1953 by Richard J. Schmelter. Now, I do know that he's planning on doing a book for every film she made during her stardom years, so that would be 1952 and Niagara, right up to the Misfits at the end. Whether or not he'll do something's got to give, I don't know. I hope so, because I think it would be interesting. Um, so I'll be looking forward to the next one. Hopefully he'll do them in order, so the next one will be my favourite movie, which is Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. But it, look at that cover, look at that gorgeous picture of her in that beautiful dress um there are pictures in it they're only tiny they're only black and white but do you know what i'm really looking forward to this this is is a short book again it's not going to take a long time to read it's actually let me just have a look got a book about his other books he's mostly done books about um sports but now he's moved to film uh, 90 pages another 90 pager um, so basically, any film star in Hollywood history had that one defining moment on the silver screen that cat catapulted them on a path to star stardom. In the case of Marilyn Monroe, it was as a smouldering femme fatale, Rose Loomis, in Niagara that started her on the way to legendary status, and also made her an iconic influencer. This project, the first in a series dedicated to Marilyn, serves as a guide to her film spanning from 53, which is when it was released, to 61, so it will be finishing with The Misfits, on an individual basis. It is filled with details just prior to filming, during production and briefly after the film was completed. It also contains critics reviews, biographies of all Marilyn's main co-stars, directors, writers and other people that help make celluloid magic on Niagara. Whether a long-time aficionado on Marilyn or a novice just discovering the screen magic created by this immortal star, the hope is that this project will not only provide trivia, but also enhance the viewing experience before, during or after watching Niagara. So, I will hopefully be reading that very soon. I'm actually going to put it on my TBR because it is only a short book. I then have the two books that my brother bought me and they're both Stephen King. One I've read, one I haven't but I don't have it in my collection. The one I've read is A Bag of Bones. Look at the chunk. That's not the biggest of his mind. When Mike Noonan's wife dies, unexpectedly the best-selling author suffers from writer's block. Until he is drawn to his summer home, the beautiful lakeside retreat called Sarah Laughs. Here Mike finds the once familiar town in the tyrannical grip of millionaire Max DeVore. DeVore is hell-bent on getting custody of his deceased son's daughter and is twisting the fabric of the community to this purpose. Three-year-old Kira and her young mother turn to Mike for help, and Mike finds them irresistibly, sorry, increasingly irresistibly, but there are other more sinister forces that Sarah laughs, and Kira can feel them too. So I remember vaguely that part of the plot. I don't remember the outcome or anything. I'm pretty, pretty sure he wins. The, the tyrannical person doesn't win. I'm sure he doesn't. But I've not read this for oh, 20 to 20-odd 20 years. When did it first come out? thing with Stephen King is he's just far far too prolific there's just he's got too many books I haven't read Holly yet I haven't got it I'm, I'm waiting for it to come out paperback I used to have loads of them in hardback 1998 um yeah so I, I would have read it not long I had it in hardback and the one I haven't read is The Eyes of the Dragon so it goes the king is dead murdered by an unusual poison while evidence is gathered and the land of Delane mourns, flag the king's magician, unscrupulous, greedy and powerful plots. Soon the king's elder son Peter is imprisoned in the needle, the top of a high tower for his father's murder. 
and Thomas inherits the throne. Only Peter knows the truth of his innocence and the true evil that is flag. Only Peter can save Delane from the horror the magician has in store. He has a plan, but it's rife with danger, and if he fails, he won't get a second chance. A captivating tale of heroic adventure, of dragons and princes, of mysterious mice and men, from the pen of the master storyteller. So yes, haven't read this one, looking forward to it. Basically, I'm going to get through the stack of books next to my bed that I have prioritised, they're my priority TBR, and then when I collect, when I do do the next one, I think I'll put Eyes of the Dragon and this one on there. I am getting another Marin book tomorrow, which I'm just going to read because it's only a few pages long, it's only a little one. But those are all the books I got in June. I'm pretty sure Paul needs, thinks I need an intervention because I have a lot of books. But I have tried to read them. And I'm still reading War and Peace, which frankly is long. But I am halfway through it. After, just after. Oh, just over halfway through it. I'm going to stop rambling now and let you go. So I'm really excited for all these books. They all sound really good. And yeah, I'll let you know what I think as when I read them. I'll be back soon with my reading wrap up for June. It's mostly physical books and there aren't that many of them this month. I didn't read as much as I did in May. But I'm still doing okay. I'll see you soon. I'm going to stop rambling and let you go. Bye now. Bye.